What's up everybody, welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony, let's jump in. Okay, happy Saturday everyone, I hope you're having a wonderful weekend. I'm on a business trip currently, so I'm a little time restricted. This episode may be a little bit shorter than usual, but there are several key developments that we need to touch on, and so hopefully... Um, This will be going out to you guys on Saturday. We've been following the Hong Kong outbreak all this week, as well as moves on the mainland towards the special administrative region. For most of 2020 and 2021, Hong Kong had one of the world's most effective responses to the pandemic, being able to keep uh, cases below 15,000 by basically crushing outbreaks as they happened under a dynamic zero cases policy. Then last week, cases exploded out of control. Unfortunately, the situation continues to worsen into the weekend, and this is very much at crisis levels for the incredibly densely populated city. Hong Kong reported over 6,000 new infections on Thursday. Any person in the city who is infected with COVID-19 must be admitted to a hospital or community isolation facility. On Friday, hospitals surpassed 90% capacity. Local Hong Kong media, quoting several local experts, are forecasting that daily case numbers could rise to 28,000 by March, 28,000 a day. Low vaccination rates are also a concern. Only 43% of those aged 70 to 79 and 26% of those over uh, over 80 uh, years of age have received uh, vaccinations. Then there is also the reaction from Beijing, which has been watching the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region very closely this week. Two days ago, we discussed local state-backed reports that General Secretary Xi Jinping had personally instructed or issued instructions to the, uh, the SAR government in Hong Kong. Interestingly, this was not heavily reported in the mainland. Indeed, there was no mention in the People's Daily, Xinhua or CCTV. These are the leading uh, central state-run publications. Uh, Non-state media in Hong Kong is now reporting that the main audience of that message uh, were the people of Hong Kong, the city's government, not mainlanders. More than one official has been quoted as expressing that Beijing did not want to stir more debate on the city among the mainland public. Another official with Beijing's liaison office in Hong Kong, speaking to the South China Morning Post, expressed, quote, The deliberate omission of the story in mainland media was a bid to avoid a public backlash against Hong Kong. In a separate article with the South China Morning Post again, analysts this week have expressed that If the Hong Kong government assumed help from mainland China to fight the raging coronavirus pandemic would be unconditional, being sternly instructed by President Xi Jinping to shoulder the main responsibility was a rude awakening. End quote. One analyst warned that the local government's days, quote unquote, could be numbered, warning that she had never been so blunt before in his messages to the local government. Yesterday, Friday, Chief Executive Kerry Lam said that due to the uh, most recent outbreak, next month's elections for her position would be postponed until May at the earliest. Next up, the Chinese economy and infrastructure. Yesterday, we discussed the signs that suggest that Beijing is set for a surge of infrastructure spending and how this is not going to be good for the long-term health of the economy and how this move just kicks China's economic issues down the road. This uh, analysis is from the point of view of the school of thought, which argues that fixed asset investment in China, though useful in the past, indeed very useful in the past, is now no longer productive and has not been particularly productive for at least 10 years and as such is not sustainable and that China should focus policy on rebalancing the economy towards being more demand-driven and thus sustainable. For simplicity's sake, let's call this uh, school of thought the rebalancing school. Now, this is the school of thought that I belong to. Uh, I believe that its reasoning and its economic analysis is the most convincing analysis of the competing economic views towards China's growth model. However, there are other schools of thought, and there is another main school of thought. Uh, This other school of thought uh, argues that not only can China continue to invest heavily in infrastructure, 
but that it should invest heavily in infrastructure. Let's call this school of thought the high growth school. Um, I do not find their arguments as convincing. I think they were convincing 20 years ago. Uh, even 10 years ago it was slept for debate, but I do not find their their analysis as convincing as the rebalancing school, which I just mentioned. But I think that it's important that we look at what these other main schools of thought um, say when it comes to Chinese growth, um, particularly when we try and understand why policymakers are making certain decisions. And for our own sakes, I want to introduce you guys to different um, points of view with with the Chinese economy, different to, to my own, um, so you can decide for yourselves. Now, a leading voice within the high growth school is Yu Yong Ding. Mr. or Dr. Yu is a widely influential Oxford educated Chinese economist. Uh, he's worked in key policy consulting positions uh, for the Central Bank, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the very powerful National uh, Development and Reform Commission domestically, as well as the United Nations and the International Monetary Fund internationally. Dr. Yu. Uh, published 14 policy recommendations for Beijing this week, and this is what he advocates, that China should set its GDP growth target as high as possible so long as it can keep inflation and financial risks under control. These are both big ifs. He further advocates that to prevent the growth from further decline, this is Chinese growth from further decline, and maintain macroeconomic stability, China should focus on boosting infrastructure investment in order to drive investment in manufacturing and stimulate consumption. He argues that the major bottleneck affecting infrastructure investment at the moment is lack of funding or lack of financing, and that issuing government bonds is key to sort of opening this up. In 2022, he advocates China should implement more expansive and well-coordinated fiscal and monetary policies, but the expansion must be kept at a proper pace. But he is very much in favor of high growth, and that should be achieved through basically government support and the pushing of more infrastructure. He believes that the economy and that policymakers should continue to build more infrastructure. This is a very different um, position than the one I and others have taken and what we've discussed in, in, in recent months. Now, I've included a link to an English version of these recommendations in the description below for anyone who wants to read what Dr. Yu and his particular school of thought says about the growth model and the Chinese economy. And last up, the Evergrande housing crisis. By the way, guys, if you're enjoying the content, don't forget to hit the like button. It's a huge help. And if you're watching this for the first time and you're enjoying some of the analysis, I release one of these every day. If you want to be on top of the latest developments coming out of China, maybe consider subscribing. A series of high-profile auditor resignations with big Chinese property companies is the latest major red flag for the crisis-hit industry, facing more than 60 billion US dollars of bond payments this year and responsible for about 25 percent plus of the Chinese economy. For me, this is actually a huge deal and it can be easily overlooked with all the noise surrounding the housing sector and Evergrande and other developers. I'm an ex-corporate lawyer and let me tell you, we do not walk away from big juicy clients like these unless it's really bad. These auditors and accounting firms are very similar. Uh, we have learned that after 27 years of service, Shimao Group's accountant has been replaced. More on Shimao in a moment. We remember as well that Price Waterhouse Coopers walked away from its Chinese development client, a developer client, Hobson Development, in late January, citing inadequate access to necessary information. Deloitte, another major player, ended its work for China Aoyuan a day earlier. Gulfan, a credit analyst with S&P Global Ra uh, Ratings, expressed in a research note yesterday, quote, changing auditors just ahead of year-end results without clear explanation could imply a deficiency in internal controls. It bolsters our view that Chinese developers need to increase their financial transparency, end quote. Meanwhile, this week, developers across the board are having one of the worst weeks yet during this months-long Evergrande housing crisis. We have been discussing this all this week. Um, there, there have been some developers hit particularly bad, particularly after the poor sales results in January. But let's discuss a few more 
developments from the last day or so. Major Chinese developer Shimao Group tried to get a repayment extension on almost 1 billion US dollars uh, to Citic Trust Co., China's largest trust firm. The developer proposed to repay 25% of the principal in 2022, 35% next year, and the rest in 2024. The markets were not happy with the news. Shamal's dollar bonds fell further on Thursday, with both its 4.75% note and its 6.125% note dropping for the fourth straight session. We remember at the beginning of the week we discussed a new distressed developer, Jin Rou or Zheng Rong in Chinese, Properties Group Limited. Things have only gotten worse for them this week. Their bonds and stocks have been smashed over the last few days now that there is concern that they cannot meet or proceed with a planned redemption of its 200 million US dollar perpetual note. The firm's bond has dropped to as little as 23 cents on the dollar down from 93 cents on the dollar just a week ago. And now we have yet another developer in default this week. According to a Shenzhen stock exchange filing, uh, Yengo, Y-A-N-G-O Group Co. Limited missed interest payments on a combined 27.3 million US dollar bond for its uh, payment, sorry, for its two dollar bonds listed on the Singapore exchange. This firm can be added to Wang He, or V-A-N-K-E in English, and Zheng Rou, or Zheng Rong, as new firms to follow. Chinese high-yield dollar bonds fell 1 to 3 cents on the dollar uh, on Friday, the fourth day of declines in a row. Chinese high-yield dollar bonds fell 3 cents on the dollar on Friday, the fourth day of declines in a row. All property developers across the entire sector are not just experiencing painful liquidity pressures, but also the worst market for decades. We remember that sales of new homes by China's top 100 property developers dropped 3.5% to 11.1 trillion RMB, 1.8 trillion US dollars, in 2021, the first decline in more than a decade. And of course, in January last month, the market collapsed. Hey guys, I'd love to hear what you thought about some of the updates we covered in today's episode. So throw your comments below. Always love hearing from you. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.